Good morning again. My name is India Nielsen Barfus. I am the program manager in the Office of Outdoor Recreation over events. Um, today we will have, hear from Tom Carter about air quality in Utah and what you can do before, during, and after your recreation activities to improve air quality. Um, Tom will be giving a presentation and then at about 9 a.m. I'll be moderating today's Q&A. Um, before we get into the presentation and all of that, of course, I need to go over some housekeeping items, which I'm sure everybody is pretty familiar with at this point. Um, Patrick, thank you. Change to the last slide. Um, this slide will show you how to use the Q&A chat feature because we will keep everybody on mute the entire time, including during Q&A. Um, this just shows you, if you're not familiar with Google Meet, how to, how to use that Q&A uh, chat function, which you will see some kind of going back and forth right now. Um, about some, some conversation. Um, we'll begin the Q&A at about 9 a.m. Uh, we'll wrap up at about 9.15 a.m., but you are welcome to type questions into the chat box at any point during the conversation, um, and then we can we can queue those up a little bit later. And we will also be randomly drawing the name of somebody who types a question into the chat, so you could win a very cool outdoorsy prize if you get engaged in the conversation that way. Um, that's it for housekeeping. I am very excited to introduce today's speaker, Tom Carter. Tom was named the second executive director for the Utah Clean Air Partnership in October of 2017. UCARE is a nonprofit organization established to bring communities together to work with one goal in mind, improving Utah's air. Tom has a diverse background, as some of you have been on the, on the meeting for a few minutes, you've heard. He has uh, a background in political and policy arena, as well as international experience in professional sports. Um, his career has taken him all over the country and world with focus on policy, politics, and fundraising, as well as professional sports management. In the policy world, he worked in Ohio, Tennessee, Washington, D.C., and New Jersey, and was an elected official uh, while he was in New Jersey. Now at UCARE, Tom sits on the Board of Governors for the Salt Lake Chamber, the Governor's Energy Advisory Council, Mike Utah's Advisory Council, and he co-chairs the Healthy Salt Lake Steering Committee. Tom was named a Utah Business 40 Under 40 in 2019, and he works diligently to bring partners together for collective impact in addressing Utah's air quality challenges. Tom, thank you so much for being here today. Thanks, India. I, I'm a narcissist, so I love hearing my, my bio, and so it just makes me feel warm to hear about how great I am. So, no, I'm kidding. I'm not kidding. Uh, great. It's great to be here with everybody this morning. I see some friends on the, on the, in the meeting, and so it's good to be here with, with you all, and uh, for, thanks for giving all of us a little bit of your time to talk about um, outdoor recreation and air quality and how everybody can work together um, to be part of the solution as it relates to what's going on here. Um, let me tell you a little bit about UCARE before we get into too much of this. UCARE was founded uh, about six, maybe seven years ago uh, as an initiative by Governor Herbert with this idea that air quality had become a little too political as an understatement. And when, when issues, especially environmental issues, get politicized, oftentimes they, nothing happens. Um, and he wanted, he wanted to, uh, to take the politics out of it. He wanted to, people to take responsibility. He wanted there to be better understanding of what was going on. He wanted to engage the public in finding ways to, to be part of the solution. So UCARE was founded to get out, get into the community, and help people know how to be part of that solution. This might come as a surprise, but there are, uh, Utahns don't necessarily like to be told what to do by the government. Maybe we see that playing out in real time right now on a couple of issues. Um, so while UCARE initially lived as a division within the Department of Environmental Quality, it very quickly got rolled out to be a standalone non-governmental 501c3. So we are not government. We are nonprofit. So we can take all your giving Tuesday money, and you can send it my way, and it'll be tax deductible. So to quote Parks and Rec, money please. Just kidding. I keep saying just kidding when I'm not kidding at all. Um, anyway, the uh, uh, UCARE has three foundational pillars within our organization. The first one is a little bit what we're doing today. It's uh, public engagement, outreach, and education. When we do it on a mass, a mass level, right? You, you, as we enter into the winter season, probably in about a month, you will see billboards, television commercials, digital messaging, streaming messaging. Uh, my team has encouraged me to start doing some TikTok ads, but I'm not going to learn TikTok dances because I'm too old for that. But uh, we're, we're out serving messages. Uh, to the public about one, what's the problem with air quality, and two, 
how they can be part of the solution. Because one of the issues we have is just general misinformation um, and lack of understanding. And because of that lack of understanding, people aren't, aren't sure how they can be part of the solution. So we are just delivering messages of, of just of how to be engaged. And we do that all across the board. So that is pillar one is, is education and outreach. Second pillar is partnership. We often say, um, if everybody's the problem, everybody has to be part of the solution. And so we are trying to bring as many individuals, communities, groups, organizations together to find real concrete solutions that they can work together to, to uh, complete. And uh, quite honestly, um, you know, you hear the governor and a number of stakeholders in the community talk about the Utah way of, of getting things done, the special sauce of Utah. Our partnership is, is that. We're not interested in, in, in identifying villains. We're interested in creating heroes and working together. And, and that, I think, is what has been able to move the needle forward so aggressively over the last uh, five, five years in air quality that people are willing to work together. And uh, we've seen that. It's one of the reasons why we depoliticized this issue so much, um, why Republicans are the chief drivers on air quality bills in the legislature. And, and let me just state, I'm not a lobbyist. We do work with, with our elected officials. But that's not our, our role is to get people to run air quality bills. Our, our, our job is to get people to engage. The last thing we do is grants. As India mentioned, I am not a scientist. I have no scientific background. Um, but what we do do is because of our, our founding that started at the DEQ, our relationship remains very strong with the DEQ. So what we do is we'll go out to organizations, groups, governments, schools, entrepreneurs, inventors, and say, if you have an idea that might drive down emissions, that could drive down emissions or shift behaviors, apply to the UK grants program. Every one of those grants is scored by the DAQ to see if it's feasibility and the cost per ton savings. Uh, and then we give out about a quarter million dollars of grants every year. That's what we do. We, we feel like we do it well. Um, we enjoy engaging the public in, in good dialogue and, and getting it and getting us moving forward. So that's us. So what's going on with air quality? Let's just start there. One of the things that I like to do every time I, I speak to a group is just set a baseline of understanding because there are a lot of words that uh, we use, that the media use, that everybody uses, making an assumption that people know what it means. One of those words is inversion. Uh, some of that word is particulate matter, some VOCs, ozone. I remember growing up, everybody talking about the ozone layer. And so we talk about ozone. Is it the same thing? Of, you know, if I use aerosol hairspray and it's going to create a hole in the ozone. Is that the same thing we're talking about when we talk about summertime ground level ozone here in Salt, in the Salt Lake region? So if, if you don't mind, uh, uh, I'm going to show a couple of videos, and hopefully this works. We tested it yesterday. The first video I'm going to show is an award-winning video on causes of inversion. It's just going to set a baseline of understanding of what's going on. So let's first start with that video. See if I can find it. Before you begin to Utah's air quality challenges, you need to understand a little bit about our geography. Many of our valleys are surrounded by mountains. Take the Salt Lake Valley as an example. It has the Ogre Mountain Range to the west and the Wasatch Mountain Range to the east. These mountains meet at the south end of the valley to create a bowl. During the winter, this bowl causes a weather event known as an inversion. Basically, a layer of warmer air acts as a lid, trapping the cooler air below. And just as the cold air can't escape, neither can the pollution. We can't control the inversion. While it happens just a few times each year, the pollution it traps can't leave the valley until after a storm or heavy winds blow through. What we can control are the emissions we release into the air. This becomes increasingly important as the amount of pollution in our air doubles every day during periods of inversion. But the good news is, even simple changes to your daily routine can have a big impact on our air. 
Things like reducing the temperature on your thermostat, being idle free in your car, or carpooling and riding transit help every Utah breathe easier. In other words, if we work together, we can reduce the negative effects of inversion and improve Utah's air quality. So show you care about Utah's air and make changes to reduce your emissions by visiting youcare.org today. So, inversions. Uh, now we know what that is. And I'm guessing because of who you are and, and your interest and engagement in the outdoor, in outdoor recreation, you understand that. But I think it's important for us to at least start on that baseline. Just a couple of points to review. Uh, our air, our wintertime air quality problems first starts with geography and then goes to weather. And then it's our emissions base. It's the things we do. It's the, it's the uh, emissions that come from point sources, area sources, and mobile sources that, that uh, are trapped by that lid, that inversion lid. And the only way to, to remove those emissions is for wind, rain, or snow. So a couple of things for you guys to be aware of. Someone comes to you and says, I have a plan that will eliminate inversions. Two things are happening. First, that either they don't understand inversions, or second, they're just a liar. So we always like to assume that they just don't understand. What we can do and what we have done, what we will continue to do is mitigate the effects of inversion. We will, we will try to draw out um, our emissions base so that instead of on the fourth day of the lid being on, we get to unhealthy air. It'll be the seventh or eighth day. And the, the meteorology will show us that it's a, there's a higher likelihood that on day five a storm will come, which helps us, than on day three will, will come. That's the, the benefit of us having these conversations about ways for individuals, families, communities, businesses to drive down their emissions. Now, I would remiss, be remiss to not mention the progress that's been made, uh, which is significant and important. Last week, uh, the Region 8 Administrator of the EPA was in town, and many of you may know this, but uh, in 2009, the, the state of Utah, these regions um, that really struggle along the Wasatch Front were, were designated in non-attainment, meaning that um, non-attainment with the federal EPA Clean Air Act standards, meaning they were exceeding the standards, that there was problems, that, that we were working, uh, we were just continually having significantly unhealthy air. So when the, when the federal government moves you into non-attainment, you, uh, you have a couple of, of opportunities and options. You have increased regulations. You, you start moving, moving levers to get things done. Uh, we, we were in non-attainment. Then we were in moderate non-attainment. Then we were in serious non-attainment because we just couldn't keep, couldn't keep driving down our emissions. On top of that, more people were coming. What's been fascinating, though, is that over the last three years, um, really after – almost a billion dollars spent by private industry based on, on regu regulations, hundreds of millions of dollars spent on the state, and then really behavioral change. We've seen, um, and including astronomical growth in this state, um, we have had three years of clean data, three years where we did not exceed the standard, and we have been moved out of serious, not, out of non-attainment and into back into attainment. It's a, it's a great day. It's a, it's a very, really great story to tell, but what's really important to know is that just because we're in attainment does not mean that we have, we're done at all because this is a geography and weather issue pre predominantly. We could have a cold, dry winter and our air could be unbelievably unhealthy. It doesn't matter what we do to drive down our emissions. And so we have to be constantly vigilant. Anyway, so I want to set that baseline related to inversions. We don't just have a wintertime problem, although our wintertime problem is easy to recognize because you can see it, you can feel it, and you can taste it. We have a summertime problem as well, and that's ozone. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share another video um, with you as well. Did you know that 
that summertime ozone is just as harmful as winter inversion. Even though it's harder to see than winter inversion, summer ozone issues do exist and pose a health risk <coughs> to those who are very young, elderly, and have pre-existing health problems. Summertime ozone is formed by emissions that chemically react with sunlight. Although the state's summer pollution levels are usually in a healthy range, there are days in July and August when the haze hangs on the valley floor and becomes unhealthy for Utahns. On longer, clear, sunny days, when there is little wind, ozone spikes. Cars, industrial facilities, household products, and other familiar activities emit nitrogen oxides and volatile organic compounds that bake together in direct sunlight to form ozone. All ozone levels impact our health. We can't control the formation of summer ozone. What we can control are the emissions we release into the air. Reducing our emissions helps lower pollution levels. And the good news is, even simple changes to your daily routine can have a big impact on our air. Things like using electric lawn tools, being idle free in your car, or carpooling and riding transit help every Utah breathe easier. In other words, if we work together, we can reduce the negative effects of summer ozone and improve Utah's air quality. So show you care about Utah's air and make changes to reduce your emissions by visiting ucare.org today. So ozone is a different problem. Uh, and really what's, what's the struggle with ozone is when our days look the best, it's hot, sunny, sky is clear. We've got a summertime ozone problem and it's an afternoon issue where, you know, basically between two and six, you've got this, this uh, hot bake of a day where all those, all those uh, emissions bake together and, and become very dangerous for you. In fact, it's almost like getting a sunburn on your lawn. Additionally, you have the wildfire issue. And as we know, we had a, a historically bad year for wildfires just in Utah, let alone the California and Oregon wildfires, which we can't control. Um, you know, while unlike inversions, which are trapped by the mountains, we can't, you know, wildfire smoke does not respect political boundaries. And so they're gonna cross over, but we can have conversations with more when more than a thousand wildfires in Utah were human caused. We can we can work on that. That's something we can work on. And fireworks, it's a whole other story for another time. Um, everybody likes fireworks. It's hard to be anti-fireworks. And I'm not anti-fireworks. We just need to have a conversation about what that means and how we can work together. So that's a baseline of understanding. Um, thanks for indulging that. I really want to make sure we're all there. So I'm going to uh, I'm, there's a story I like to tell in relation to, uh, especially with outdoor groups. Um, and I, I recognize that uh, I'm very indoorsy. Uh, you guys can tell that I, I, I enjoy uh, television and uh, pizza. Um, but I like the story. It's about a, a gentleman named David Brailsford, who in 2003, the British uh, national cycling team was in a mess. They, uh, they, in 108 years, 108 years, they had only won one gold medal in cycling and no Tour de France. And so he was brought in to be the new head coach of the cycling team. And he looked and, and tried to do some math, tried to figure out what was going on, and tried to find a, an edge for this team to bring them into a position as he wanted to, wanted to win. He wanted to put them in a in a place to win. He didn't think that they could do kind of the traditional things that other teams were doing to win, which of course was drugs and steroids. And so he's, he went about and, and implemented the economics principle known as the aggregation of marginal gains, which is if you can improve 1% in overlooked and unexpected areas and you aggregate that together, you might find ways to move your performance you aggregate it, performance in a, in a larger marginal and a gain together. So we, he identified a handful of things. And the three that I always like to talk about is, you know, when you think about staying in hotels, I don't know, I'm not a guy that gets a good night's sleep at a hotel. I, I like my mattress, I like my pillow, I like being at home. And so he thought, well, you can't travel with your mattresses, you can't tr uh, travel with your, your home, but what we can do is find great pillows. So we can travel with our pillows and that will help increase our our sleep and it's a, it's a 1%, uh, it's a 1% gain and let's see what that will do. He also, it's like the bikes are the bikes are the bikes, but maybe our seats need to be better. And so he went and found a better, tested all kinds of seats and increased the seats. 
Additionally, thought, you know, maybe there's a way to make our, our tire stick to the road better. And so he found a rubbing alcohol and worked on that. It's totally legal. And he, he did that. Just uh, so they continue to find these 1% gains across the board. And five years after he just took over, the British cycling team dominated road and track cycling events in 2008. Olympic Games in Beijing, where they won 60% of the gold medals available. Four, year late, four years later, in the Olympic Games in London, they raised the bar and set nine Olympic records and seven world records. And that same year, Bradley Wiggins became the first British cyclist to win the Tour de France. The next year, a teammate won the race, um, and he, that same teammate named Chris Frome went on to win again in 2015, 16, and 17 giving the British team five Tour de France victories in six years. So why do I tell you this? What does that have to do with, with air quality? What does that have to do with, with what we're talking about today? Well, here, what, at air quality, at UCARE, we like to say in our efforts to clear the air, there are no perfect answers, but there are practical solutions. As I mentioned in the offset, billions of dollars have been spent in what we refer to as low hanging fruit. The rest of it, is marginal gains. The rest of it are things that families, individuals, communities, um, businesses need to do small and simple steps that we all can do that aggregated together will have an impact. And we see this, we understand it, and we know that those, these certain handful of things that we can do will help us have aggregated together, have a significant impact. So. Uh, on air quality. Many small actions taken together can have an epic positive attitude on air quality. So the way I want to frame this conversation is, is on an, an outdoor adventure, right? A pre-adventure, a during the adventure, and a post-adventure, just to frame the conversation. Um, and we can talk a little bit about a, a summertime adventure, whether you're going four-wheeling or hiking. We can also uh, talk about winter time whether you're going on your snow machine or skiing some of this stuff is is transferable um, because it's just all about finding ways to drive down your mission so let's just talk a little bit about things you can do prior to your adventure so one thing especially in the in the summertime um, is as we know with our summertime ozone issue um, that that there's that window that two to six p.m window where emissions bake together. And so there's a way to move your emissions around. So one of the things we encourage people to do, especially in the summertime, um, is to fuel your vehicle late, later in the evening once an ozone period has washed out. And that's marginal. But you think about, those are what we call VOCs, volatile organic compounds, get emitted, or it, it's minor, but it get emitted when you fill up your gas tank. And so if you can do that late at night and, and those emissions will get washed out every night, especially in the summertime. We also encourage people to find um, and use zero spill EPA approved uh, gas cans. Um, and those will reduce your emissions across the board. So fuel late in the evening, also um, for your whether it's your RV, your snow machine, your, your ATVs, fuel those at a good time that will reduce and then be, and then be uh, spill free. Um, and that'll help for the heat of the day, especially in the summertime, but also just emissions in general. One thing we also talk about, um, and, and I won't get into too much of this, and you can do a little research on that, is find ways to fill with tier three fuel. Tier three fuel is a low sulfur, sulfur fuel, which is mandated and, and by, this, by the federal government. And there's a lot of math and science involved in this, but what we have is three, three, of, our, um, three of our five uh, local refineries are currently producing tier three locally. And a fourth will be breaking ground in, in two weeks, three weeks on their tier three project as well. Getting that tier three fuel produced locally means that we'll have the purest, best tier three fuel available. A tier three fuel matched with a tier three ve uh, vehicle uh, will, when, uh, is like taking four out of five cars off the road, reduce your emissions of 40%, a tier, uh, sorry, 
a tier three, um, a tier three vehicle is any vehicle that's 2018 model year or newer. The, um, the, uh, and even if you don't have that new of a vehicle, you'll still see an aggregate, uh, a, a marginal gain of 10 to 14 to 13%. Um, and I saw the question and Michelle Brown just gave you the answer um, in, in, the, in the chat on where you can get it. And there's a website. Um, uh, there's, there's also a, a nuanced answer to, to where you can get it. And it's, you can get it everywhere. It's all fuel is tier three fuel, but that website will give you the purest who's buying locally tier three, three gas as well. There's struggle with that. So we like to incur, um, encourage people to buy, buy tier three fuel. Additionally, this is a uh, this one is a little bit more complex, and that's you know use electric. If you can if you can or pur purchase an electric vehicle, we encourage that. We understand that it's expensive, but it's not it's becoming less and less expensive. The state uh, has just incentivized not the right word. The state has just allowed Rocky Mountain Power to invest fifty million dollars in EV infrastructure statewide in their service region, so eighty percent of the state. It's going to happen over the next five years, $10 million a year, which is really exciting and important. When we think about um, why people don't purchase electric vehicles, it is, our data shows us it's less about cost and more about charging. Um, what, we, what we talk a lot about is range anxiety. Everything has a name now. People are concerned about where they're going to get the next charge, even though new EVs have a 350, 400 mile range, which is similar to that of a, of your gas tank. People don't feel anxiety about getting gasoline because they know that there's a gas station every four blocks or less. But they don't, they have a little bit of anxiety about wondering where their next charge is going to be. And so um, we believe kind of the, which comes first chicken or egg, the, the idea of getting more, more and more infrastructure in place will, will solve that problem. You think about your anxiety related to the charge on your phone, right? How do people respond when their phone's at 50, at 20, at 10%? Where's the most popular place at the airport? It's by a, a plug, plug jack, right? So getting as many charging stations out is important, and, and we believe cars will continue to flow as that happens. Additionally, the most popular vehicle in America is the Ford F-150. Um, there's an electric F-150 coming to market in the next four months. And when Ford doubled, doubles down on electric, electric vehicles and we're doubling down on electric infrastructure, we believe that this will be very good for, for air quality and for us and for all these things going on. We also want people to check, check their tire pressure. Cars run better when you uh, have less emissions when your, air, your tire pressure is, is up. And then um, uh, the other thing is, especially, I, I was on the call with one of our, um, I was on the call with, uh, this week with one of our um, ski resorts. And, you know, we were talking about air quality, we were talking about code, we were talking about a lot of things. And this is, a, this is one thing that we encourage everyone to do. However, it's a little bit tough in, during COVID. Um, and that's, don't show up to the mountain with an with just you in the vehicle. Fair way to fill your car. Now if you could you should you can if you can fill it with your family, that's great. Fill it with friends, wear masks. But that will get more people on the mountain, but also it will take vehicles off the road. Carpool to your adventure. Um, carpool safely and uh, to your adventure. That is a big deal, in, um, and will help us. Additionally, I think one of our biggest problems, we kind of create these mini inversions when we're up, heading up the mountain because of all the idling. People just sit and you move every four minutes and you idle your vehicle. I need, I need you to be idle free. And I think we can all do that. I've had a number of friends and, and colleagues and, and partners say to me, but it's cold. And as I said, you know, you know, there are no perfect answers, but they're practical solutions. And, you know, bring a blanket or a hat and gloves, which you're going to have anyway, because you're going up the mountain and turn off your vehicle, put on your hat. That's a way to stay warm. These are just ideas uh, and practical solutions. The final thing pre kind of pre-adventure is if you can take transit, wear your mask, 
bring your bring your hand sanitizer and get on the bus head up the mountain get on tracks find a way to get up there without even using your vehicle and that'll drive down emissions and that's really exciting during your adventure um, just a couple of things responsible recreation is is an easy one there's you know regular maintenance of your boat your rv your motorcycle your snow machine that'll just increase performance and reduce emissions Additionally, if uh, burned clean, you, you can lose electric or propane uh, on, for summer, um, summer cookouts or rent, drive electric when you're, when you're have, out there having fun. Those are just some similar, simple, easy ways to do it. And then uh, post in the summertime, so once you get home from your adventure and the post in the, in the summertime, you saw these suggestions in our video. You can mow your mow your lawn with an electric uh, with an electric lawnmower or just mow in the, in the afternoon in the evening right once the once everything's been washed out mow in the evening but really think about switching to electric the batteries uh, are, are stronger they work better they're quiet in the winter time um use an electric snowblower or a shovel um those are great options and opportunities we've done a number of uh, partnerships and, and and switch out programs to get people to switch to that. And it's interesting, um, what we like to talk about is that, uh, you know, the, the percentage of emissions that come from snowblowers is the exact same of the percentage of emissions that come from other refineries. And it, that's partly because when we use, we use our snowblowers the moment a new lid co comes on. And so if there's a way to, use electric or shovel get a hire a kid to shovel so you don't have a heart attack that's just a good way to to move it the other things we've talked a little bit about before just just to travel wise carpool skip the trip take transit walk or bike around limit your driving be idle free and then the last thing i want to share with you on this specifically is is telework um i see michelle brown on the call and she she's done a lot of great work for the state on telework we provided her with this data um if if it worked for covid we would be sitting in a room together having this conversation it'd be much more interactive um and that'd be great but one of the things we we like to say um we've had we have said over the last few months is maybe the only silver lining in um to the pandemic has been telework for years, what we've seen as we tried to move forward with teleworking is uh, is there's been pushback and people giving us kind of three basic um, excuses as why they don't want to do it. One has just been general attitude. The second uh, has been perceived productivity, and the third has been um, infrastructure. Well, look at infrastructure. Here we are. I don't know. Pe people use Google Meetups, Google Team. Well, I don't know where this one's called. Google something they use google they use zoom they use outlook they use teams they, there's all these things that we just didn't you know i always joke that if i had a, a flux capacitor and a delorean i'd go back to march and i would probably wouldn't i'd maybe warn some people about the pandemic but i'd probably buy stock in zoom and then retire um and because uh, it's been amazing how infrastructure has been solved for the most part there are still a lot of problems with with internet access and, and issues that way. Um, but we wanted to go into the market and find out what have attitudes been and how they changed or what's going on with productivity. And we, so we did a survey. Um, we did this in June because if you remember, numbers were dipping significantly in June. We were thinking the whole state had moved to yellow. At that point, we're still using the color coded system. And we thought, wow, by the, after the 4th of July, maybe we'll all be going back to, to the office. We were wrong, unfortunately. But we gathered a lot of data, 7,500 participants in our survey, including an executive track and an employee track. Um, in different businesses all over the state, including government and, and different sectors. 97% um, of participants are doing some sort of telework. 55% of that time um, were teleworking exclusively. 100% of the organization were. Uh, it, teleworking what we found um, and there's new data on this but what we found in our in our survey was that 66% of respondents had a positive positive 
a feeling attitude towards telework prior to the pandemic. Um, and 57% of employers had a positive, uh, positive feeling toward positive outlook towards uh, telework prior to the pandemic. That number jumped to 86%, 20 and 30% uh, jump. And we think even as we further along, in fact, there was a presentation in the legislative committee where it's jumped even to kind of a night into the 90s. Uh, um, of people's just perception of it. Additionally, 93% uh, of respondents say they have maintained or increased productivity during their work from home. Other things that people have loved have they, 92% of people have loved have they reduced or no commute. 72% see a benefit of how they have increased time with their family. 85% of people are saving money. Well, 70% um, of employers are, say that they are seeing reduced costs savings in their organization from utility to travel to meals. The problem that we're seeing and 50% of our respondents are saying that they do not love, they have limited connectivity with coworkers and decreased sense of team. And we have try and work way to find that. The reason why we ask this question is we want to know if people will be willing to do this moving forward, specifically with air quality. 94% of employees said we would be willing to tell community specifically for air quality. 93% of employers said they would be willing to do it. And that's good news for us, especially when we look at this in the summer and fall, thinking maybe if we went back to the office in November and January, we could help people implement a stay at work, stay at home program as we built into an inversion. Granted, it doesn't look like we'll really get back into the office um, and uh, we'll get back in the office till next summer. But still, we think that this telework data that, that we're putting together, that the state's putting together, that other organizations have put together will help us identify some issues or, or wins as we get one month from now into inversion season. And so I just wanted to leave that with you. Um, you know, you guys are already on the team. Most of you are, are, are practicing this. You're figuring out ways to be part of the air quality solution. So what we'd like, our ask from you is to help us find people to buy in. Find ways to encourage your neighbors to be idle free or to carpool. Help identify new wins, new situations for yourself, your neighbors, your community, your business, uh, your friends to help drive down these emissions and help people understand that the problem is about first weather and then first geography, then weather. But then if we can slow the growth of, an, of emissions into that inversion, we can have, um, we can have cleaner, better air we're always going to have inversions. Keep in mind that just because, at times, just because the air looks bad doesn't mean it's necessarily always bad. Fog plays a role in this. But we have to be vigilant. And so, we, one of the great things about Utah, one of the, the top things about Utah is our outdoor recreation opportunities. And so we want to ensure that this is a, an ongoing opportunity for us. I said this yesterday to a group that we got very, very lucky in 2002 that it snowed almost every day during the olympics um we are as we continue to bid for an olympics uh in whether it's 10 years or 12 years or 14 years from now we have to continue to drive down emissions work with weather to ensure that, that we can we can live up to our potential that's all i have i'm happy uh, appreciate the time that you guys gave me happy to answer as many questions as you might have one Thank you so much, Tom. I, is my voice level back to normal? Okay, perfect. Thank you. Um, so a couple questions that came through from Cody and anyone else feel free to add questions to the chat. I've actually got one too after I asked Cody's um, that kind of go hand in hand. Um, it's one about how effective is it to use tier three in cars um, older than 2017? And then also who sells tier three fuel in Utah? I know that link was in the chat. Thank you for that, Michelle. Um, but Tom, I know you mentioned before that there's specific, I don't remember all of them, but like um, Chevron is like a gas station that always has tier three. So could you go into those gas stations and then cars that are older than uh, 2017? Yeah. So. If you have a 2018 model or greater, you're going to get an 80% reduction. If it's lower, it's less, it's marginal between 7% or 14%. So it's still, a, it's still a gain. It's still a reduction. Tier three, it's less sulfur fuel. We'll, we'll do that. It's not 
it's not as significant, but it's something. And so we are, um, so used tier three fuels. To answer your question, the additional question about where can you find them? So specifically, all Chevron stations, Chevron uh, Speedway, Sinclair, um, uh, Texaco. Those are the easy ones off the top of my head. And then you're going to see some Mavericks, some Costco's. Depends on who they're buying from, um, where they're buying their fuel from. And so what we're working on is getting the other two local refineries. You know, um, so Maverick buys fuel both from Marathon and from Big West. When they buy from Marathon, that's pure tier three. When they buy from Big West, it is. It's not 10 parts per million. It's 14 parts per million. And 14 parts per million is still pretty freaking good because tier, tier two is 30 parts per million. So um, it's, it's kind of an academic exercise, but it's still a, a significant uh, gain for, or reduction for all of us. Thank you. I'm going to, I'll, I'll queue it up for Hugh and then we'll, Cody will get to your next question. Um, I, if anyone needs to hop off at 9.15, um, like I said, I'll send this out. So uh, feel free to if you need to, or you can uh, email some questions over my way and Hugh, I'll turn it over to you. <clears throat> thanks, India. And, and thanks, Tom. This is Hugh with Wasatch Front Regional Council. Hey, um, Hugh. And it, it's great to hear you talking about telework. And, you know, we're as an agency certainly looking into this and it's really important for us to see how it's going to work. And sort of what we're looking at preliminarily is, uh, you know, the vehicle miles traveled. So how many miles people are actually traveling in their cars <clears throat> isn't going down all that much with teleworking, but it, it's not being concentrated, right? It's not in the, the peak hour commutes in the, in the morning and in the, in, in the evening. So we think that'll certainly help um, with the air quality as, as those miles traveled are stretched out throughout the day, <clears throat> hopefully, and, and not compacted. But we're watching that very closely um, with this whole new behavior uh, situation, right, with teleworking. A um, couple of questions for you. With, you know, you mentioned the snowblowers, and I think um, I read an article last year that running a snowblower for two hours was the same thing as driving from Salt Lake to Miami or Salt Lake to Miami to back or something. Like, something blew my mind. <clears throat> um, has there been any talk about uh, at the legislature, not that you're lobbying, you know, about um, limiting or prohibiting the use of things like two stroke motors and those types of devices that really are disproportionately adding to the air quality woes when they're, when they're used. Um, so, Let's just, great question. And you're absolutely right. Salt Lake, it's actually Los Angeles to Miami. Um, is, you know, two stroke, two stroke unions are, you know, you don't have a catalytic converter. It's all bad. Um, so limiting, limiting or uh, not allowing, let's just use current political, uh, current political realities as a baseline. Uh, people, are ultra libertarian about what you can and can and cannot tell them to do. Uh, and that's just a political reality. So what the legislature has done and UCARE has done and a handful of, of, of groups together, Rocky Mountain Power is we've done, we've done ways to make it more affordable. Our, our, our biggest stumbling blocks for people participation is time and money. Um, and so, We've done a couple, three, um, three snowblower exchanges where if you bring in your gas-powered snowblower, a, a, you know, a, a top-end snow, a top-end electric snowblower can cost as much as four hundred dollars. We'll take your gas-powered snowblower. We'll um, give it. Uh, you give us that one. We'll sell you a, a, an electric one for sixty bucks. Um, we've done that same thing with. With every summer, we do a couple thousand lawnmowers. Um, so this year's snowblower exchange has been been postponed due to COVID. We just can't find a safe way to do it. Um, but that's been kind of the way that the legislature, along with the federal government and, and some of the NGOs, have found to be the the most effective way to move this forward. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, so to to turn it back to um, these, this tier three question, uh, another question from Cody, does tier three change fuel mileage? No, not that I know of, I don't, I don't believe so. It hasn't changed mine. So. Okay, thank you. 
And then, like I said, add more questions to the chat. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and ask mine just because I'm <laughs> curious. Um, so you mentioned working with a variety of groups. You mentioned schools um, as one of them. And I, I, I've heard you know, about measurements taken at schools and things like that. But I'm wondering if there are ways that you've like really involved kids, whether it's assemblies or um, some kind of school project or um, something like that, just because our office is really focused on, uh, very passionate about getting every kid outdoors. And as a part of that, making sure that they learn some stewardship components of, of being outdoors. So I'm just wondering what projects and things like that you've done. Yeah, that's a great question, India. The, um, we have funded and worked very closely with an organization called Utah Clean Cities, who is the champion of the Turn Your Key Free Idle, Be Idle Free initiative in, this, in the region. And what they do is they engage with students in the schools to spend time with parents in the pickup line, talking to them about why they should turn off their cars. And that, um, you, know, you think about recycling education in this country, you think about drug, the DARE program, um, recycling became something we did because in the late 80s, early 90s, they went into schools and taught kids about recycling. Now it's just something we do. Um, so uh, we fund a program through Utah Clean Cities, we fund a program through Breathe Utah to go in and do education, education at the school's level to help kids be stewardships of the issue. Additionally, we helped, uh, there is an air quality education component during driver's education. And so we, wrote the, we wrote the curriculum for that. So those are some ways that we're working with schools and, and kids. Terrific, thank you. And then it looks like we just got one last question in from Hugh and then we will do a drawing um, for a prize. Hugh asks, are there are a handful of apps slash websites showing local air quality, any tips on which are the most reliable? Um, and yeah. I'll add on to that too, reliable and user-friendly. So the best app is called Utah Air. Um, it is run by the Division of Air Quality. It'll give you your, um, the official air quality um, readouts from where you are turn on um, you know, turn on locations uh, is it's on both major you know Android and iPhone it's it pull it'll pull from your EPA station data so it's not so it is the most reliable so that's what it looks like right now additionally it'll tell you at the bottom like give you a forecast and your action actions so it's unrestricted action right now so Utah Air, which is one word, Utah Air, capital A. Um, and uh, then website, the best website to get tips and information of things you can do is quite shockingly, ucare.org, U-C-A-I-R.org. Terrific, thank you. Um, if anyone else has anything else to add in the chat, feel free to, I'm gonna go ahead and draw, I've got a bowl here with, well, I don't need the bowl. We had two folks ask questions, which thank you both. I've got two post-its here and Hugh Van Wagnon, you win a prize. So I will get in touch with you um, and, and figure out mailing and, and we've got a couple different options. Um, Cody, thank you so much for, for all the questions. That was actually really helpful for me to hear too. I didn't, I didn't know a lot of that. Um, and Tom, thank you for all the information. If you have any last thoughts, feel free to just throw them in, but we do appreciate everyone's time today and, and hope um, that you've learned something and, and can pass it on. I will follow up with this recording um, and additional resources a little bit later in the week. Tom, do you have any last thoughts? Just keep being part of the solution. We really appreciate everybody that's engaged. Um, it's important and we need to keep bringing more people into the conversation. So share our videos, talk to your friends, be a part of us, follow us on socials, get out there and, and be part of it. Thank you so much.